<laughs> Matthew chapter 6. It's a sparse crowd today. Last week we were packed out, this week everybody got sick. That really is what happened. <laughs> so glad that you're here. We had had a special this morning, but the guys lost their voices. And so, uh, it's just one of, those, one of those things. And it's just amazing to me. I really like the way that this one went, though. Like, everybody got sick at once. Yeah. And then it's over with. Mr. Taj looks fantastic. He was, like, first one down and first one back. I hope I look as good as, well, I don't ever look as good as he does. <laughs> but I hope as, I'm feeling as good as he looks like he does. Uh, by tomorrow, boy, he looks fantastic. Uh, he looked like he was in, in the throes of death on Wednesday. So <laughs> here we are, in Matthew chapter six. Not fooling around. I would like to. Uh, I like to just read verse five, and uh, then we'll we'll get into our study today. The Bible says, "And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are." For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Well, let's let's just stop there, and we'll ask the Lord to help us with our uh, with the Scripture today. Father, I do ask for your help today. We do need not only to have hearts that are willing to listen, but God, we need your help for understanding. I pray that you would help us not to be distracted by auxiliary truth, but that we would capture the main truth that really helps us to see your heart and what you want from each of us as individuals who are your children. I pray that you would help us to understand discipleship better as a result of, of getting in the Scripture today. And I just pray that you meet the needs of each person that's here. Thank you so much for each one that you've brought to be under the hearing of your Word. And I just pray that as a result of our faith that we would see it increase our knowledge of you, and then God, give us a practical way we can live for you this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Or in that portion of Matthew, actually, which is a favorite for many people, how many of you would say that Matthew 5 and 6, the Beatitudes, are your favorite part of the Bible? Everybody here would say the Sermon on the Mount, and everybody's like, no, I don't like that. I've had people that would say, I, I know like Pastor Nick, for instance, uh, down in Marathon Baptist. This is a passage of Scripture that if you ask Pastor Nick to preach for something, he's going to preach out of Matthew 5 and 6 if he's not preaching somewhere else. Like if he gets to just preach when he wants to preach, he'll preach Matthew 5 and 6. Sort of like if you ask uh, Taj to preach, he'll preach from Psalms. You know, you can kind of know, like this is, the, this is an area that this, mean, this is meaningful to this person. And Matthew is that way uh, for many, many people. Now, on Matthew 5 and 6, I believe that the Beatitudes are the, or the Sermon on the Mount are one of the most misapplied passages of Scripture in the Bible <coughs> because many people make the Beatitudes God's requirement for salvation. In other words, this is how you can be saved. And yet they're not at all. First of all, I would point out to you that the, Jesus is addressing in, these, in this sermon series, He is addressing His disciples. And uh, disciples are not unbelievers. And disciples, uh, disciples are individuals who have already believed. But what also uh, help you? I think what would also help us to understand is the realization that Judas was one of the disciples. He was also one of the twelve. And uh, the fact is that Judas is not an individual that we'll be seeing in heaven. But he was a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And I want us to understand very, very clearly. If you can clarify this in your mind. That the Gospels, John 3, where Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Gospel is simply that if you'll look to what Jesus has done in your place, and you'll receive Him, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. If you'll receive Jesus as your Savior, you'll look to Him. God will save you. Discipleship's a matter of being a follower of Jesus. And Judas was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple, even though he wasn't a believer, hadn't received him as his Savior. So I wouldn't want any person to come here today and think, well, this is the attitude I need to have to be a disciple and to somehow confuse what you do for Jesus or what you do as a disciple of Jesus as qualifying yourself for God to say that you're good enough to be in heaven. The fact is, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody's good enough. And no one can do anything 
that by way of good works, that would zero out or make to not exist the sin that we've committed. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus died for our sins. And I will say to you today, as emphatically as I possibly can, that if you're here today, your first and foremost need for every person, no exceptions, is the work of the cross. Because you need what Jesus did when he died on the cross for you. And God doesn't save any person because they're a good disciple. I've seen people burn out trying to work their way to God. You cannot do it. It's impossible. But if you'll realize the things that God wants from a disciple, you'll be able to live for Jesus. And I think that would be where the majority of us would fit today. We've believed in Jesus. We've received Him as our Savior. But we want to be disciples. We want to be effective disciples. So the first thing that we see that Jesus teaches His disciples, we saw in the last several weeks, begins in chapter 5 when He begins to tell them the way that a disciple should think. First of all, He emphasizes to them that a disciple doesn't think the way a, per the way a person in the world thinks. He said things like, Blessed are the poor. The world doesn't think there's any blessing in being poor, does it? It says, Blessed are the merciful. The world doesn't think, honestly, there's much to be gained from mercy. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Uh, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not many people uh, like to have the humility to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. We don't think of that anyone should have to bow before a holy God and should desire spiritual things. Everything that Jesus said about discipleship, friend, is a contrast or in stark contrast with the way the world thinks. But the reasons Jesus gave for each of those things, my friend, are evidences that is absolutely the, not only the way that God thinks, but God's way of thinking is right. You struggle with your purpose in life. I'll tell you something, probably a good place to start to adjust your thinking is to look at what God says is blessed and what God says is not blessed. And I'll just tell you, you say, Pastor, I don't see how anyone can be blessed being poor. Uh, God's right about this thing. Luke 16 is a good example of when we look at the story of, the, of Lazarus and, and uh, the rich man, isn't it so? Well, I want to look at our text today. Last week in, verse, in, in chapter 6, we saw that when we give alms, we're not supposed to do it in order to be seen of men. And I want to see a statement actually uh, that's all through chapter 6 because I want us to see the flow of thought. Will you look with me to chapter 2 in the last phrase? Do you see right after the period, the glory of men? Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Will you look at verse 5 in the last phrase? Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And... Uh, if you will go down to uh, verse 16. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Do you see this? Now we have several contexts, don't we? First of all, giving, alms giving. That is giving to the Lord, or you're giving, uh, giving for, in, in giving alms, oftentimes it's given to the temple, given for the poor. And a lot of people would do so with an announcement. And the Bible says that there's a warning here. If you give so that men can see what a giver you are, then you got what you were looking for. In other words, you, you look to impress a man, and you were impressed by a man, and the, Jesus said, verily, I say to you. That word verily is an important word that modern translations oftentimes exclude, sadly enough, because that word verily carries with it the concept of profundity. That is, this truth is profound. It's always right, it's always true, and it's one of those concepts about truth or about God uh, that is always true. And so, don't give to be seen a man. If you do, you'll have your reward. In today's context, the Bible says that when we pray, we're not supposed to pray for men or to impress men. Now, I understand the notion when someone prays of, especially when you, when, when you are a representing a group or a body in public prayer, for instance. You understand what I'm talking about? You ever met a thee or thou prayer? All thou most holy, magnificent God. And then that person then proceeds to quote every scripture they've ever memorized 
you know, and they quote scripture, and then that thou wouldest and shouldest, and that thee, and that I, and that da 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 da, and a lot of flowery language that actually doesn't really communicate a lot more than just this is God speak. I'm, this is the way I talk to God. I don't talk this way normally, but I'm speaking, you know, spiritual language or something like that. And uh, what's that for? I don't mean to be critical or pick on anybody. If you're thinking of somebody, shame on you uh, for thinking of somebody in particular. Uh, but the reality of it is that why would someone talk like that? I think that there could have some origins. Like, for instance, I've heard before that when you pray, you need to realize that you're coming into the throne room where God is. And God's holy. And so though we go with boldness, having full access because of the work of Christ, we do not go into God's holy throne room flippantly or carelessly. Isn't it so? I'm bothered by much of, the, of contemporary worship today just because I think that it lacks a reverence. This is, I'm just telling you, I'm just sharing with you something personal. I'm not attacking or going after anybody, but much of contemporary worship today, I believe, lacks a reverence. In other words, people are very cavalier or very careless. Many times uh, somebody will tell me, this is the way I perceive God or this is the way I feel about God. When actually the Scripture says, when Jesus is talking specifically about where and how to worship God, uh, Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the thing that sometimes the truth part is something we're a little shy on. We don't quite know what God's Word says, and we kind of define Him our own way or worship our own way. And I'll just tell you something. If God doesn't say it's worship, it isn't. You may intend it for worship, but it isn't. Now, I'm going to be a little bit shocking in saying this, and I, I don't take it the wrong way, but that attitude is the same attitude Bob Marley has when he talks about worshiping God by smoking weed. True. I'm not trying to be silly, I'm just trying to make a point. In other words, the idea that I can worship God however I say is worship, Bob Marley believes the same thing in the Rastafarians. We don't do what we want to do before a holy God. So there needs to be a reverence, doesn't there? There needs to be a reverence when we go before a holy God in heaven. And we ought to err on the side of caution, I think, in the throne room of God. Don't you think so? Uh, if, it's, if it's a holy place that so we don't have the right of access without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which, my friend, is a very serious matter. Very costly matter. Okay, so the Scripture says that when we pray as believers, we're not supposed to pray like the hypocrites. In other words, you know, try to find the most prominent place and stand there acting holy, if you will. Oh, God! In heaven! Oh, calm down, Bob. It'll be okay, buddy. You know, you, you get up and, you, and you, you start to do something in order for people to look at you and think, oh, that guy's spiritual. People do this to me all the time when they find out that I'm a pastor. They'll say, what do you do? I'll tell them, well, I'm a pastor of a small church. And uh, then they'll start telling me, how spiritual they are and how in tune they are with spiritual things. Many people will tell me about a vision that they've had or something special God has done. Why are they telling me that? If they really had an experience with God, that's between them and God. Why are they telling me? <clears throat> well, they want to be impressed me. They want me to be impressed with their spirituality. Why is a person stand in a public place praying to a God when they could stand in a closet and pray to Him? Because they want people to know how holy they are and how connected they are with God and how spiritual they are, and how in touch and in tune they are. And friend, I just want to tell you something. Uh, be careful. Be careful about believing that kind of nonsense. And be careful about wanting to do that. What if you prayed all the time and God answered prayer and nobody but you and God knew it? I'll tell you what if. You'd have some great things between you and God. You know, I think there is a degree of prayer that Jesus is trying to illustrate here. I'll come down. It's my back that makes me move up. There's a degree of prayer that Jesus is trying to illustrate here and trying to help us to understand something, and that is that there's something pretty special about having a connection with God that's intimate, that's private. In the same way that in particular relationships, the closer a relationship is, the more shared, the more shared things that are just for that relationship there are. The same is true with an intimate relationship with God, isn't it so? I don't think it would be wrong in this audience today to simply say that there are things that belong only in marriage, for instance. Hebrews 13, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers 
God will judge. In other words, there are things that belong only in marriage and belong only between the two married people that are very personal, very private, and very appropriate that are shared that make that a unique relationship. And they don't belong anywhere else. And anywhere else they're corrupted and they have all kinds of, uh, of uh, bad outcomes. There are things in relationships that are, that are special. For instance, as a pastor, I have a relationship of confidentiality with a lot of people. Lord, sometimes people come to me and they say, Pastor, I'd like you to share something. I, I, I'd like you to know something's going on. I don't want you to tell anybody about it. And so, I don't go out of the room after sharing something and say, I know something you don't know. Right? No, it's something between a couple of people that's appropriate and ought to be shared. Ought to be shared anywhere else. Lord, it's the right thing. You know, the same ought to be true with our relationship with God. You could ask God about some things that you wouldn't want anyone else to even know. You could be struggling with a sin in your life, for instance, that you need victory over. And it might be that no one else even knows you're having that struggle, but you and God both do. And my friend, you could have victory. And it could be your personal, private victory. And you don't need to stand on a corner and pray about it. You need to go to a private place, a closet, and pray about it. And the Bible says God which seeth in secretly shall reward thee openly. Your victory will be evident. It will be obvious by the fruits in your life. People don't need to know where that came from. It's not that you're taking glory away from God. It's that you're not advertising you're talking to God. Because when you pray in that way, and you ever, let me give, live, use one last illustration for this. You ever, um, <laughs> you ever notice the the person who doesn't talk on the phone to the person they're talking to, they're actually talking to the crowd they're with. You know what I'm talking about? They're on the phone and they're talking like, like not like in the phone voice, hey, how you doing? You know, talking just to the person on the phone. They're talking to everybody around them. Man, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do tonight. Da, 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 da. And, they're, and they're kind of bragging, you know, bragging about their life, bragging about whatever, or trying to show what an interesting person they are or whatever. And you know, they're actually not talking to that person. They're talking to everybody in the room. That's what people do with prayer a lot of times. I don't know how many times that I felt, and again, this is the way I felt, I felt when I'm praying with people that they're more praying to let me know how in touch with God they are than they are praying to ask God to do something that they're entirely helpless to do. Now, friend, here's the point. God is a supernatural God who's able to do things which for men are absolutely impossible. And the reason we pray is to ask Him to do things that we need. Do you need some things? Listen, I do not need people to think I'm spiritual. I need God to do some things for me. That's what I pray. And that needs to be the mindset. Jesus <coughs> says, beware. I mean, it's a, it's a strong warning. Okay. The second thing about prayer that we're not to do, the Bible says, is to use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. When I first met my wife, she really embarrassed me really badly. She wasn't my wife at the time. In other words, I didn't meet her and say, oh, your wife, and we got married. No, I met her, and we became friends first. And uh, she said, you know when you pray, you know how many times you say, Lord, and Lord, we, and Lord this, and Lord that, and Lord, and Lord, and Lord. Lord, we just need to, and Lord, we, and Lord, and Lord, and Lord. And uh, she said, you know how many times you say that? It kind of embarrassed me because I never noticed it, but I became very self-conscious about it afterward. She said, you know, you don't talk to me like that. You don't say, Melissa, 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 but you do it to God. And as believers, God wants us to talk to Him, not with God speak, quote, God language. He wants us to speak to Him on a very intimate, personal level, in a very personal way. He wants us to just say, God... I need. He wants us to be direct. In other words, I don't go to somebody uh, when I need something. I'm going to ask him. I'm not saying to be disrespectful or irreverent. There are things that we're going to see that we're supposed to do when we pray. But, you know, you don't just go without an introduction. Let me give you an illustration of this. <laughs> there was a guy that I went to school with, and he was very unique. I won't say his name because many people that would have gone to the same school but were in college went there with him. But he had a 
unique personality. I think he was probably um, dis or, uh, autistic, pretty pretty severely autistic. So he had a unique personality. I like I enjoy autistic people. Some of my best friends have been autistic. They're just they're they're uh, they're they're special. <laughs> just say, and uh, it's interesting. Two of us, my friend and I, we had been away from college for a while. He was still there, this man, young man. And we were back for college days, and we were going to go to the alumni game, basketball game. And we walked up the steps, and coming down, uh, this young man is coming down the steps, and we see him for the first time in like two years. And uh, he says to, uh, actually it was Lee's brother I was with, uh, David. He says, David, you just missed it. They just da 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 said something that happened inside the auditorium, and then he just went on by. I hadn't seen him in two years. He never said, hello, how have you been, where have you been, what's been going on in your life. He's like, David, you just missed it. You know, da 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 And I, you think, yeah, okay, maybe you just missed something, but how about saying hello? Hi. Okay. Now, there are formalities or niceties that ought to be in a conversation that show that we care about someone. Right? You ever gone to... Uh, the fast food restaurant where you get the grunt or the stare, like the, you know, this is really commonplace, I hate to say, but in many of our local fast food restaurants, um, people refuse to acknowledge you. And I don't know if they, I don't know if they understood what I'm saying or not. So I always wait for them to acknowledge me. Um, so you go stand at the counter, and the person just kind of like, they don't really look you in the eye, but they kind of look at you. Like, I just want you to know I don't like you. I don't want to get, take your order. I don't know who you think I am, why I have to serve you. You know, that, that sort of thing. And so, they won't say, hello, what can I get for you? Or what may I do? What can I do for you? Or anything like that. They won't address you. They just look at you. And so you'll say, I'd like a number one with, you know, biggie sized and, you know, hold the Coke give me some Coke, and, you know, whatever the order is. And then you just kind of... You're supposed to pay now. But they're not going to communicate. They're not going to bother to talk to you. And that's just rude, isn't it? Uh, I do this sometimes. I get phone calls at the worst times. And I'll see a call, and I'm like, oh, I've got to take this phone call, and I'm standing in line. Don't you hate that? When you're standing in line and on your cell phone, you realize you have to take this, and then... You know, you're ordering from somebody. I usually try to say, could you hold on just a second? I'm trying not to be rude. I want to talk to you. And then you try to talk to the person or whatever. And, uh, you know, you have the person that just doesn't acknowledge you. Okay. We don't talk for the sake of words. We don't just use vain repetitions. But there ought to be things that we acknowledge when we pray, right? The Bible says don't use vain repetitions uh, in verse 7. For when you pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. Now this is not saying don't bother asking God because He already knows what you need. It's not what it's saying. What it's saying is don't say it over and over and over. The closest thing I can think to illustrate this is the rosary. Say this many Hail Marys. That's a vain repetition. I don't think that most people who say Hail Mary, first of all, I don't think they're asking God, and I don't think that will get them anything. You don't pray to Mary. But secondly, I don't think that the prayer really means anything to the person. They just think because they've said it so many times and that they have gone through that ritual that God's going to do something either by way of pardoning or granting something for them simply because of the repetition of the thing. A lot of vain repetitions aren't there things that people do, motions, movements, spiritual things that you think, you know, affect God. No, my friend, I'm just tell you something. God's, not, God's a person. We're made in His image. And repeating things doesn't make God answer your prayer. doesn't convince Him of your sincerity. He knows your heart and He knows your needs. And I find this rather comforting. Okay, so how do we pray? Verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, how many people have stopped praying and begin to pray the Lord's Prayer because of this. Isn't this too bad? If you were to read Luke chapter 11, you'll understand the reason Jesus is giving this format for prayer. 
What does it mean when you say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? Well, first of all, you're acknowledging the separation between you and God and the things that distinguish between you and God. Remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus, No man hath ascended into heaven but the Son of Man which has come down from heaven? What was he pointing out? He's pointing out you can't get to God, but God can get to you, and I'm the way to God. So when you say, Our Father which art in heaven, what you're pointing out is you're in heaven. Remember when the astronauts from Russia got into heaven or got into, into the space and they said, I don't see God. Remember this? Yeah, well, God's beyond the heavens. In other words, God is inaccessible. I was looking at, they, some, I read some news article this last week about how they reversed the thrusters for the first time on one of the, what is it, a satellite or something like that. And they said something like, they're using the term billions of miles. That's a lot. That's, that's a little tough for me to fathom that man can make machines that travel billions of miles, actually. I'll tell you something, God's beyond that. It's beyond the reach of that. And when you say, Our Father which art in heaven, you're acknowledging <coughs> there's nothing I can do to come into your access or your presence. Secondly, you're acknowledging that hallowed by hallowed be thy name, if I were able to get to where you are, God, if I physically could travel to the place you are, your holiness again separates me from you. In other words, there is an access when I pray that I do not rightfully have because of who God is in contrast with who I am. And my friend, that is not a pretext or pretense of humility. That's reality. Without Jesus, I cannot even pray. I am separated from God, not only from my inability to get to God and my need for Him to reach out to me, I am also separated from God by His holy character, which would make it so that I could not come into His presence without dying. Hallowed be thy name. And then, the second thing to acknowledge in prayer is God's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is interesting because some of those that perhaps would have sat in on this portion of the Scripture in Matthew 6, some of those who would have sat in and heard this would be individuals who understood that there was a ministry or a part of the Messiah that would have to do with His kingdom. <coughs> why, did, why did they conspire to kill Jesus? Because they didn't want His kingdom to come, to be quite honest. In other words, the religious rulers of the day actually may have stood on the corner, they may have disfigured their, themselves, or they may have uh, put on ashes and, and uh, worn clothes to show that they were fasting and looked miserable and prayed publicly to impress people with their spirituality. But the actual heart attitude they had was, God, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent your kingdom from coming. Friend, when you pray to God, your attitude is, God, you're far away from me, you're different than me. And God, I want your kingdom, I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I wish things could be on earth like they are. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if things in earth were like they are in heaven? I don't think we have the faculty to comprehend that, actually. We don't have the imagination to, to, to comprehend how things will be on earth if they were done the way they are in heaven. But when God's Christ's kingdom comes, that'll be how it is. It'll be precisely how it is. When we pray, acknowledge who God is, acknowledge who we are, and then accept God's will. Say, God, I want what you want. How often are we unwilling to pray for what God wants? Are we willing to surrender to what God wants? Then we pray for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. I've, had, I've been rebuked before by believers that say, you know, I don't bother God with petty things. I just don't bother God with petty things. Um, if ever you have your ability taken from you, you'll realize how much you need God for petty things. There are people, literally, who go one day from literally being able to have anything their hearts desire to the next day being 
unable to have anything. You'd be amazed at how much give us this day our daily bread would be a blessing for you if you realized how much we actually are dependent on God or how much God actually gives us that we don't depend on Him for. All it takes is uh, to, to realize this. I don't know if you've ever... Have you ever been delirious? Have you ever been delirious? You had a high fever or something and, and uh, you, 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 your consciousness was not reality? Yeah, some of us have. Have you ever been out of your mind? You realize what a privilege it is to have your faculties and be able to think. You say, Pastor, it's never happened to me. I control myself. Well, if ever you lose the ability to control your mind, you'll realize how very little in control you actually are. I mean, seriously. It's amazing how little physical strength, how easily we can do some things, and then how difficult those same things can be on the flip side as well. <laughs> like I said this last week, it's, it's, it's comical. It's funny to me. You can laugh all you want to. But I literally sneezed in the car. My back went out. And I was with Charlie. Hey, Charlie, wake up. Charlie will bear witness to this. I was dropping Charlie off at Wendy's by his house on Thursday night, and I was going to get the pump out of the car, and I didn't know my back was, I knew I you know, tweaked it or something. But until I tried to get out of the car, I didn't realize it was a problem. And when I tried to get out of the car, I literally couldn't. And then I went home afterward, and it was worse. I go to get out of the car, open the door, I can't move my leg. Can't make my leg get out of the car. And if you ever had your back go out and you realize, wow, that's really, well, I'm moving all right today, but I'm telling you, I dropped something on the floor, I'm going to get a Luke to come pick it up for me right now. I consider myself able-bodied, but I tell you, it just takes that to lose the ability. You know where your ability comes from? It comes from God. You know, we need to acknowledge God in our prayer. God, thanks for the ability to breathe. If you're unmedicated, to God, thank you, I don't have to take heart medication. Thank you I don't have to take blood pressure medication. God, thank you that I don't have to take diabetes medicine. If you have to take those things, God, thank you for heart medication. Thank you for diabetes. Thank you for insulin. Thank you for, thank you for, thank you for. Give us this day our daily bread. God, I need you. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense here today? In other words, listen, my friend, without him, you can do nothing. And you can take that phrase from its context and put it in any context and it will be accurate. You cannot breathe without God's giving you breath. Your heart cannot beat without God's telling it to beat. You didn't get up this morning and uh, calculate how many heartbeats you're going to need today and set yourself in a rhythm and, and concentrate on it all day. God's doing it for you. Give us a stay our daily bread. And then forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You think you're beholden to owe God something? You know, many believers actually feel or act as though God's beholden to us. Let me tell you some of the things I've done. You know, this I love Christmas season because Christmas is really the time to give. You know, I like to go down and I just, I don't enjoy Christmas at all myself. I just go down and serve the homeless. And I give out Christmas dinner. And I do this and this. Why are you telling me that? I don't know how many people have told me that. Why are you telling me that? You know, Christmas is about it's about what Jesus did for you. It's not about what you did for somebody. But people think, oh, I just do this and this and this and this and this, and I'm so generous and I'm so benevolent and I'm so I'm so. Well, listen, you ought to be anybody who's grateful, anyone who realizes what God has done for them, ought to do, shouldn't they? Oughtn't we to be generous, giving servants? Well, sure only because Jesus Christ modeled being a servant to us. And then we see, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh, how many of us could have victory in our lives if we would acknowledge that we do not have the strength in our flesh to be delivered from sin? <coughs> when I look at the evil of the world and I look at its influence around me, I realize how many things I'm aware of that I'd never struggle with if I didn't know about them. And I realize how, how often we are susceptible and how easily our flesh can succumb to sin. I have seen in, in my short lifetime, I have seen so many believers fall. 
So many people absolutely destroyed by in the throes of sin. And I believe that oftentimes it's because they lack this element of prayer. Deliver us from temptation. Lead us not into temptation. God, I don't need to go through temptation. I think some believers think I'm strong. I, you know what? I, it's for the strong to go through temptation. You know what? It's for the strong to pray and say, God, keep me from temptation. Deliver me from the evil. Deliver us from evil. And then we see the conclusion in this text. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then Jesus points out the necessity of forgiveness. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I've had people that try uh, to teach this portion as a requirement for salvation. In other words, you can't be forgiven for your sins. I'm talking about not forgiveness as a believer, but you can't be forgiven and be born again until you forgive others. Is that what the Scripture is teaching here? Is that what discipleship is about? No, my friend, this is teaching discipleship. The reality of it is, if you understand the work of the cross, you recognize that Jesus did not partially die. And Jesus did not symbolically die. When Jesus went to the cross, He actually shed His real life's blood. He actually gave His life for yours. And so He did not die for you the moment you're born again and now it's up to you. No, He gave His life for yours. It was an entire substitution. Your entire life and your death and Jesus' life, and He died. So, He took your death and died, and he took, he took His life, and God gave that to you. So friend, let me ask you a question. Is there anything a person in his lifetime could do that Jesus' death is insignificant for? And the answer to that is no. It's an emphatic no. Absolutely not. Jesus gave His entire life for yours. Listen, when you're born again, once saved, always saved. Jesus gave His life for you, and He died. And Jesus gave you His life, and you live. What kind of life? Eternal life. What kind of death? Physical death. Jesus died for your sins. Not figuratively, but actually. Having explained that, then what is the Scripture saying? When Jesus says, you need to forgive men your trespasses or God won't forgive you your trespasses. What's well, a fellowship issue, actually? If you were to read 1 John, you'd see that the Bible says, speaking to believers who Jesus has died for, who have eternal life, if uh, we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And His truth is not in us. We do sin. But the Bible says if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is, a person who is righteous can sin and can be out of fellowship. First John emphasizes fellowship is lost when a believer sins. And my friend, you can be saved and if there is unforgiveness in your heart, you don't receive forgiveness for your sin with regard to fellowship. And you'll be out of fellowship with God. You'll be out of fellowship with believers. And you know it and God knows it. And that's the reality. And a person can stand on a street corner and they can pray with a loud voice. And they can use vain repetitions. And they can let everybody know how much they mean business with God and how spiritual they are. But the reality of it is if these elements are not a part of their prayer, they're not in fellowship. There's a lot of unforgiveness with, quote, spiritual people. You know, this might be the time of the year that you and I ought to get real about some things. It might be the time of the year if there's unforgiveness, we ought to say there's unforgiveness in my life. You know, one of the reasons we're teaching our Sunday school right now and dealing with depression, one of the reasons for it is this is the time of year when a lot of people are down. In spite the great things that God has done, just people are just down. They're struggling right now. You know one of the reasons why? Oftentimes unforgiveness. You don't forgive men their trespasses and so you're not forgiven. And so you're out of fellowship. And friend, I'll tell you something, there's nothing more of a downer than being out of fellowship with God. 
And so we saw in our text today, we saw several warnings. We saw from last week that we are not to give alms to be seen of men, so that we, if we do, then we have our reward. But if we do our alms in secret, our Father which sees in secret will reward us openly. In verse 6 of chapter 6, we saw about prayer. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. And we saw how to pray. And so friend, my challenge for us today, I know that this is basic. This is foundational for believers. But you know, I think sometimes we as believers have problems in our lives that are created from overlooking the basic or foundational truths. And I think this would be a great season of the year, wouldn't it? To acknowledge some basic truth. To evaluate ourselves and to let God have His way in our hearts and to respond accordingly. And so we're going to conclude our service now. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And when we conclude, we're going to have a time of invitation. And the invitation will be a time when we'd invite you to do business with the Lord as an individual privately about the things that we've seen in the Scripture today. God, I just thank You so much for this passage of Scripture which so clearly lays out how to be a disciple, a follower of You. And Lord, the area of prayer is one where we see that we have to be very, very careful. We have to be very, very honest. You do not want vain repetition. You do not want to show God, you want a sincere heart. And I just pray that you would use what's been taught to have a work in our hearts and change us to be like Jesus. We ask in His name. Amen. I think it would be appropriate because of the message today to have an invitation that's a private invitation. So I'm not going to ask anyone to come forward this morning or I'm not going to ask anyone uh, to show by raising their hand whether this would be something that God's dealt with you about. But I would like to have just a minute or so Whereas individuals, we could, in our own space, have our private place and do business with the Lord as He's spoken to our hearts. And so let's have just a minute for that, and then we'll conclude our service this morning.